My name is David Levitt. Uh, in 1970, I got my first English Bulldog, and uh, he was a great dog. His, his body did not live up to his spirit. Um, he lived a normal lifespan for a Bulldog, but uh, he was a huge character, and uh, I showed him in AKC confirmation shows. Um, I got the book, The Complete English Bulldog by Colonel Bailey Haynes, and it has a selection of early bulldog art, and I saw my ideal dog there. So I decided to breed back to a dog with the looks of the old English bulldog, uh, pre-1835, when bull baiting was made illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, virtually all the bulldogs of that period were working dogs, and uh, obviously a healthier shape than the modern bulldog. Uh, they had a tail, they uh, obviously weren't born cesarean, and uh, they were bred to to catch a bull or bear by the nose and hold on. I didn't want the old temperament, and uh, uh, I started with my English bulldog and a pit bull bull mastiff bitch that was bred for boar hunting in Northern California. <coughs> I was living in San Francisco when I got her, um, so that's what I started with, half bulldog, quarter pit bull, quarter bull mastiff. Uh, she was a crossbred dog, and uh, to that, to that, uh, their progeny, uh, I bred an American bulldog, bulldog, and uh, I started four unrelating line breeding schemes with the same ratio of dogs, half English bulldog. One six pit bull, one six bull mastiff, one six American bulldog. Um, so I lost two of those lines to genetic problems, uh, epilepsy, and hip dysplasia. Mm. So I got down to two lines. <clears throat> it worked out to uh, eight unrelated dogs that I started my breeding scheme with. So um, I worked on it for 24 years. Uh, got very little help. Uh, interesting, I, I, I got in touch with one of the brothers who started the uh, Argentine Doggo and uh, got to ask him how he get, got them breeding true to form when you started with, with so many breeds. And his secret was cousins. He had a lot of human cousins and he put the dogs out with them and he still controlled them. Uh, my problem was when I got people started who I would hope would help me, uh, after a couple of years they felt they knew more and they didn't want to x-ray hips. From the beginning, uh, I x-rayed hips and uh, so after, after virtually 50 years, uh, we've gotten the hip scores up for the dogs. Uh, now we require hips, elbows, and back x-rays. And uh, we've recently started requiring genetic testing before we give breeding approval. So, uh, so the dogs are bred for health and also temperament. Uh, I want a friendly dog. I think any of these dogs can, can have the drive to work. And uh, we've had dogs that have done uh, search and rescue. We have the, the first bulldog that can, that's been through the Canadian military program. Um, we've had dogs that got Schutzen, IPO, BH, um, and uh, we have dogs that are national weight pull champions in Europe. Um, they pull at a lower uh, at a lower level there than here, but we we've, we've had dogs with it pulled very respectably here too. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not pushing protection work because of laws in Europe and. Uh, so we, we have not been pushing protection work because of that. Uh, <clears throat> Americans just don't want a health screen before breeding. So I have very few American breeders. Most of my breeders are in Europe now. And uh, I have a wonderful group. I personally have had rescue dogs since 1990. And uh, for me, it's a dream come true getting the help now that I really needed in the beginning. And uh, my breeders are doing all the hard work and uh, the dogs have been continually looking better. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy with the way the dogs look now. Um, I quit breeding myself when I had 
finally achieved a dog uh, with the looks that I wanted and the temperament I wanted. Um, you know, I'd, I'd gotten the legs longer, uh, healthier, more normal shape. And uh, right now, my European dogs and, and the dogs in this country are matching the old artwork, which is, uh, which is really the scale for me on, on success or failure. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the dog program in a nutshell. Uh, my, the, the, the dogs have, have changed and improved conformation and uh, the temperaments too. Uh, my breeders are doing such great work and now we have, tra dog training has come so far from, since when I started and um, our training begins with socializing uh, the day of birth and mm -hmm. I highly recommend puppy culture for anybody breeding dogs. Um, before puppy culture was a super dog program developed for sensory, sen sensory stimulation for military mm -hmm. dogs. It was a U.S. program, and now uh, puppy culture has taken over from that. And the critical period for puppies is is before si up to 16 weeks. So the early work uh, really can set the temperament for the dogs. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Dogs are my life. I've been training hard um, for the last 12 years. I have a wonderful mentor, and uh, you know I've been training in agility, obedience, rally. Uh, I have a little rescue dog who's got four titles, and uh, you know she's a dog of a lifetime for me. And <laughs> I was walking shelter dogs when she was surrendered. Uh, I said, "Beautiful head on that dog. It looked like a." A little 17 pound pit bull mm -hmm. and started crying and said where do I surrender her and she was two and had never been to a vet never had a good meal was in rough physical shape uh, chronic bowel syndrome and uh, and she moved from a really bad neighborhood in Riviera Beach to to Palm Beach and had a house of her own and her first bed and toys and uh, she's she's got a lot of drive and super trainable and uh, um, I just love seeing dogs and handlers advance. Uh, currently, I'm training um, people who rescue dogs and, and their shelter dogs at the big shelter here in West Palm, the county shelter. And uh, every Saturday morning, I'm training there and, uh, and love to work, love to work dogs. You know, the... Uh, Sure. I mean, I, I like to start with a friendly dog and, and teach them who to bite. So, mm -hmm. so uh, because most people don't control their dogs enough. So mm -hmm. if I make a mistake. I want it to be on the friendly side. Uh, right. but a good decoy can get most dogs working. Uh, so, uh, again, it's a problem for me because of, of laws in Europe. Right. And uh, they just want any excuse to outlaw bull breeds and it's happened right. in Germany and there have been there have been problems with old English bulldogs being seized in Germany. Oh, okay. In other countries that they, they don't allow any percentage of pit bull no matter how far back. So it's, it's a problem. They, right. they also uh, a number of countries don't allow e collars. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. In, in training, we've come so far, and uh, from when I started in, in the beginning, um, Keeler was the gold standard for dog training, and I cringe to think of the things we did in his name and following mm -hmm. his direction. Personally, I don't think he was as rough on dogs as, as what he recommended in his book. Uh, I know people that, that trained with him back in the day, and he did great with movie work, and he was a major trainer for the Second World War. And, you know, if you have a hundred thousand dogs to train, you have to use different techniques than, than you can right. training one dog at a time. But uh, training has come so far, and it's very interesting now to see what's going on. That uh, Karen Pryor did a book which started a movement where you don't tell the dog no. Mm -hmm. It's happening with dogs and happening with children, and uh, you can teach a dog to do tricks with uh, without having a no. But when the pressure's on. Um, I think that they can't take the, the pressure uh, of big distraction. If, mm -hmm. if, 
you don't have a no, and uh, and the big dividing line is now how much punishment to use in dog training. It right. used to use a, a leash correction and a lot of them and strong ones, and uh, and some of that if it's not done done right, it doesn't build teamwork. And uh, what you need in dog training is a team. And it should be like a dance team with one leading and one following. And most dog problems are because the dog is leading and not the owner. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. There were only two ways of training animals until recently, operant and classical. And operant is, uh, is, is uh, reward and punishment. Uh, and classical is clicker training, where you use a, mainly a sound and uh, and then reward afterwards, Pavlovian style. You do it ten times, click treat, click treat, and then after ten times, you you pick a dog's behavior and click and treat it. So for my dog to put her toys away into a basket. Um, you start in small steps and the dog looks at the toy, click treat, and you increase your criteria, the performance that you will reward. And so the dog has to look at it longer, click treat, then it has to take a look at it and take a step towards it, click treat, stand over it, click treat, put mouth on it, click treat, pick it up, click treat. And, uh, and you, you can develop a dog that presents a lot of behaviors so that you can pick what you want. And, uh, uh, it's, and it's, it's interesting to see the protection guys and the service dog trainers uh, discovering shaping behavior with a clicker. And uh, so now there's a new kind of training uh, called social training developed by a graduate student in Hungary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also called uh, Do As I Do. And uh, she discovered that dogs will mimic your behavior. So it's interesting to see the tests. Uh, uh, it's also called copy this, and they have yeah. tests. And uh, you put your dog on a sit, stay, you say copy this, and you do something like walk across the room and ring a bell two times, a hanging bell. You come mm -hmm. back to the dog, assume your position, and say, do it. And the dog goes over and rings the bell twice. So, uh -huh. so now there's a third kind of training for animals. Very interesting, and and it's funny because uh, gorillas and chimpanzees that have virtually the same genes as we do. When you point, they won't look where you point, and it's it's funny. Dogs will look where you point. It's a uh, it's called puppy culture. Uh huh. And, uh, Super dog, which I'm more familiar with, started starts on, I, I believe, day two, and you take the puppies and you hold them in different positions just for one or two seconds. Uh, you hold them on their back, you hold them head down, uh, you rotate them, you put them on a damp rag. It's, it's sensory stimulation. And uh, in, the in, in, in the research that went along with it, they found that dogs that are handled this way at a young age their brain grows in a more complex fashion, and the military wanted it to have increased working ability. So mm -hmm. uh, puppy culture takes it farther, exposing them to noises in the proper way and, uh, and different things which make them much better socialized when they're older. Mm -hmm. So this is a very common problem in all dogs. Uh, mm -hmm. Some dogs, they get jumped on once, and uh, their temperament flips. Uh, my best friends have a dog like that that was fine until it got beat up by two standard poodles, and uh, now it, it, it starts the aggression before it gets jumped on. So there are a couple of techniques to use. Uh, Patricia McConnell is a wonderful trainer, and she has uh, booklets on all training problems, and she's got one on Feisty Fido. And uh, what she recommends is uh, a real strong watch cue where uh, you say watch and you start it with a high value treat up, up by your nose and you say watch and when the dog's eyes gaze comes to you you give a positive marker and then food right away and, uh, 
and you teach them to look at your face. Uh, mm -hmm. You start with luring with the food, and then as quickly as possible you go to not luring but using the food to reward. And you can get uh, such a strong watch command that uh, you can take an aggressive dog and walk it right by another dog, and it will just keep looking at you. Um, you know, timid dogs actually can be harder to get over their fears. Uh, a, a lot of aggressive dogs, it's coming from a place of fear, too, that it's not true aggression. Um, so, yeah, uh, alpha roll is a, a huge mistake. Uh, when the dog uh, appears to relax, it's not relaxed, it's just playing dead. Uh, mm -hmm. Just wants you to stop holding it down. So, uh, you know, alpha roll is 40 years behind the time, and anybody's doing that shouldn't be training dogs. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, for guys, it's, it's just, uh, you know, real attractive to manhandling the dog and then having them relax, but it, it doesn't solve the problem. And it doesn't, uh, for dogs that it temporarily solves it, it doesn't permanently solve it. You know, some, some dogs, it's just a problem of the, the dog being the leader, and so the dog makes the decisions. So uh, basic obedience, I really like that it, it changes that. And uh, just like a dance team, one's got to be the leader. And in basic obedience and, and expecting a, a high level of performance, it, it changes and, and the, uh, the person becomes the leader. And a lot of dogs and a lot of aggressive dogs relax once they know they're being protected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your management is, is working for you probably. And, uh, you know, with McConnell's technique, she has a couple of other things she does for management. <coughs> she sees a problem coming. She, and you practice this with no problem. But when you see a dog coming, uh, or what's worse is, a dog comes from around a corner and all of a sudden you're presented with a dog. You do a 180 degree turn and rapidly go the other direction. And you practice that with, with no distraction there uh, so that it's automatic. You may use a, 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 a cue like turn and you say turn and do a 180 and a few quick steps. Uh, the dog's used to doing it and when faced with a dog all of a sudden you do a turn and a few steps and get away from it quick. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was at an event this week with 2,000 dogs <laughs> uh, walk for the dogs at our uh, wonderful private uh, shelter here in West Palm Holes, Peggy Adams. And out of the 2,000, I saw a handful of dogs that were under control. Um, virtually none of the people were aware of their dogs. Uh, you know, the last thing that's said before most dog fights is my dog is friendly. You cannot <laughs> trust other people. Uh, you can't trust their dogs. Yeah. And uh, with my little dog, you know, I just say my dog's not friendly. You know, and, uh, and I put her on a sit and stay and let the people go by. You know, it's, it's very frustrating. You know, I, I talk, you know, you can't trust other people's dogs. So, you know, they're wonderful training programs, uh, just basic obedience, uh, family dog classes, and, uh, you know, they'd be especially good for you to have other dogs around, you keep, keep 10 feet between the dogs, but to get them used to listening to you around dogs. And then when, when there's a problem, you know, you put your dog on a sit, and it's not, the dog is not, it's, it's not that you, you told him, don't attack this other dog, you told them to sit, and sit means sit no matter what. So mm -hmm. uh, he's got to sit there and have a solid sit, and uh, when there's a problem, it's the problem is he's breaking the sit, breaking the stationary position. And uh, so, you know, basic obedience is wonderful, and it's, this, this stuff is, is simple, it's just bringing them along <coughs> those steps, uh, usually people skip steps and they expect too much and uh, you just go slower and you know your dog may have trouble with loose leash walking most dogs do and there are techniques to get that and rapidly get that uh, and you know the first thing is by not looking at your dog when you're trying to heal but 
looking forward, shoulders square, watching the dog in your peripheral vision, and move out. And instead of you uh, having your behavior shaped by what the dog is doing, the dog's behavior should be shaped by your movement. So that you you march out, you know, no matter what the dog's doing, and he will get it, and he'll come up with you. He may go ahead of you. And uh, in the beginning, if he does go ahead of you, you stop. You don't let him pull. It's nice if you have a long line. You turn the opposite direction, uh, move in that direction, call your dog. As soon as his eyes come to you, food, good, a positive marker and food. You know, the basics of dog training are positive markers and negative markers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, positive markers and negative markers escalate. For me, my positive markers are good, excellent, and then full party. And you never always give one treat. You become boring to the dog. You've got to be like a slot machine and pay off. When it does something much harder, you've got to acknowledge it with your excitement. Guys have trouble showing their excitement and showing their emotions and, uh, and treat, treat, treat. Uh, you know, and it helps to have a high value treat. Uh, mm -hmm. Trying different things and seeing what the dog really wants. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be more interesting than the distraction. And uh, the same with negative markers, that they escalate, uh, nope, no, ah, and then uh, leash pop, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not doing, uh, you know, the, the big, the big uh, conflict in training now is how much correction to give. And uh, the truth is, when people ask me about a prong collar or an e-collar, uh, I say, fine, make sure you get it to fit on your neck. Because the problem isn't with the dog. You know, you can't expect the dog to do something you haven't trained him and to be under your control at a level, uh, uh, a higher level than you have expected him to. And uh, you advance dogs with three Ds, distance, distraction, and duration. And you get the dog doing basic obedience, and in the stationary positions of sit, down, stand, uh, you gradually uh, in increase duration. So in the beginning with the dog sitting next to you, you just turn your head from side to side. And some dogs will break with that. And the second step is to pivot in front of your dog and pivot back. And you start with one second. And you build up to two seconds. You see people jump too quick. And you got to go in small steps. And uh, uh, on down, what could be more uh, comfortable for a dog? You know, rapidly, my friend Jordan Aradisky, rapidly he has his beginner dogs on a down and stay for half an hour while the owners are watching TV. And mm -hmm. break, the dog is brought back, put in a down stay again. And uh, uh, the secret of dog training is. Perseverance, consistency, and intent. And intent, I mean your intent. Your dog knows your intent instantly. As mm. soon as you think something and feel something, dogs are all about body language and they're masters at it. Uh, when they first came into the fire as a wild uh, dog, they, uh, they were there for scraps and, uh, and then early people discovered their value in hunting and in alerting at night when some when a predator was coming in and, uh, and the relationship started with people and when times got tough uh, they ate the dogs mm -hmm. so uh, dogs learned that their survival was based on body language and it sticks with them today still right i started collecting art showing the dog of the period. And there's a range uh, in the old bulldog from cobby, bully, little ones to rangier, long-legged ones. And, uh, and bulldogs look different ways, different periods. And, and bull baiting started around 1100 AD, was made illegal in 1835. And originally the bulls were loose and running through the town and it was a big spectacle. And uh, the dogs were probably jerking their head and flipping them onto their side. So they were a, a much bigger dog. Later, they had a collar on the bull and a rope to an anchor in the ground. And uh, the dogs were bred smaller and uh, were supposed to 
grabbed the bull by the nose, which was the only place to control the bull. The farther they got from the nose, the worse they were. And they would hold on until the bull got tired of smashing them onto the ground and stepping on them. And uh, when he finally put them down on the ground, that's when the dog won. Uh, as the dogs came, the bulls would throw them 40 feet in the air and they'd break their backs when they'd land and the owners would run and try, try and catch them. There's some way they broke their fall with a bamboo pole. I, I still haven't figured that out and I've never seen art showing it. So uh, dogs were used on bulls, they were used on bears. Um, the bears, they had a collar and uh, lines to pulleys on the wall. And actually where Shakespeare was performed in London during his life, um, there was a, a, a bear baiting ring there. And uh, actually years ago, I got to go to London and see the place. There was a building there now, but uh, it was dockside and, uh, where the old theater was. Wow. So that's what the old dogs were bred for. Um, it was a, a cruel thing, but you have to realize that at the time, a third of a, a major city could be killed in a witch hunt, that there were bad things being done to people. Uh, the English were not as big on witch hunting, although they did it as some of the European countries and uh, places were decimated by that. So uh, you know, we looked at animals differently and you know they rationalized it about uh, if the bull died with adrenaline pumping, the meat would be more tender. But, you know, really, I think it's probably the opposite. You, know, you don't want adrenaline pumping. And uh, and actually, with with the, the valuable tuna, you know, I'm a fisherman. And <clears throat> when they build up lactic acid, uh, the, the Japanese buyers core the fish and they look at the meat and they can tell if it's got, if it's, they call them burned. And, <clears throat> They're worth much less money. You know, at the dock, they decide what the fish are worth. And uh, so, uh, you know, for, for, for big tuna, you get them to the boat, and if you fought them for a while, you revive them until they're, they're totally revived, and, uh, and then you kill them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the meat's more valuable. So they're, more. they're all from the original dog, so they're. They're half English Bulldog, one six pit bull, one six bull mastiff, one six American Bulldog. And, uh, and the confirmation I'm after is like a smaller hybrid American Bulldog, mm -hmm. judged American Bulldog, son, and uh, you know, the apprentice was some of the, the best judges. And they were wonderful and really, really educated me on judging. Uh, I'm very beholden to the NKC judges who took me on as an apprentice. And, uh, I apprenticed nine times and learned a lot, uh, and I did that before I came back to judging. Uh, and I really like the hybrid ABs, uh, and I, I'd like a smaller version. Mm -hmm. You know, my problem was the people who did come to me and and, and I, I was hoping to have helped me uh, went their own way shortly afterwards, and uh, they knew from the beginning that you had to x-ray hips. Because that's a danger with English Bulldogs, and they didn't want to go to the expense. They didn't want to know. You know, for me, that's stupidity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going you're gonna to make a tragedy for a family down the road, because their dog is going to be three years old and not able to walk. Mm -hmm. so why would you not want to check that and when you can just do a hip x-ray and, and avoid it and not breed a dog with bad hips? But, you know, the amazing thing today is that it's only... A couple years ago, I saw x-rays of a, of a two-week-old puppy, and the joints have tons of space between them. The, the, the joints are not together at all. Mm. There's so much that can happen that can, can cause a, a bad problem. We, we don't really know. We know there's a genetic com component to hip dysplasia, and that's why we x-ray. A lot can be done from poor rearing over exercising a puppy, letting them do steps, uh, you know, that can turn into bad joints that, that isn't genetic. So, you know, that's very interesting. And I, I've never seen the x-rays until recently. It was shocking to see how open the joints are. And for that reason, you shouldn't 
shouldn't work a dog hard till it's it's more mature. I've seen weight pull dogs that were work too hard too early, and uh, you know it's not a good thing for the dogs. And uh, steroids aren't good for dogs, just like they're not good for people. And I've seen them used on dogs too. One year, start lightly, not not put real pressure on them till uh, a year and three quarter or two years. They're they're pretty mature. Uh, mm -hmm. Different dogs and different breeds mature at, at different ages, um, but you know I, I would not work them early. And I and for those who are going to neuter, never neuter a dog until the joints are mature, because they need the hormones for for the for the maturing process. So you know for for shelter animals, we have to do it while we have them. And you know with cats, we start at three pounds. At three mm -hmm. pounds, and you neuter them. And you, you just have to do it because there's different considerations. But if you want to do something for the health of the animal, you know, I would not neuter a, a bulldog till till two years old. And you know, for a female, yeah, you're going to go through two heats. But yes, you have to do it. It's important for for joint health. Eighty pounds is max. You know, I, I don't want a big dog. And you know, historically, if you have a dog stuck on a bull's nose and they're a big dog. They're likely to be a parting of the ways, part of the nose comes off. You know, the dogs were not real big. They were just stayed on and, and didn't quit. Uh, so I don't want a real big dog. And, you know, we have a, we have a, 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 as complete a standard as possible. You know, I want to leave a legacy that can be followed. And, uh, you know, I've got a great board of directors of wonderful breeders, uh, both here and in Europe. And, uh, and, you know, we're strict about breeding approval and, uh, you know, now we've added genetic testing too and um, some, some genetic problems don't turn out to turn up until the dogs are 8 to 14 and uh, whole lines have these genetic problems and nobody knows because the dogs are dying before the problem comes out. I had a neighbor with a German Shepherd and I didn't realize it, but the dog was dragging its rear end because of a gen genetic problem, uh, DM, de degenerate myelopathy, where mm -hmm. it's the use of their muscles and it starts in the back end. And you know, now I realize it wasn't hips that this dog had a spinal problem, mm -hmm. and it's genetic and it can be rapidly bred out because it's recessive. You know, the recessive problems and with gene testing the way it is now, you can you can get your your sample from puppies at two weeks old. And, and with some gene tests, you can have the result in another week. And with recessive, you'll have clears, you'll have carriers, and you'll have affected. And uh, you know, you can pick your freeze and only use those for breeding. But again, people are driven by the money, and uh, they don't want to know. Uh, you know, they're going to be losing a percentage of their income from the dogs. You know, the the important thing is the proof is in the pudding. A very good trainer here told me that, and uh, you know we're talking. The only thing two dog trainers agree about is the other one's wrong. <laughs> and uh, you know he said the proof is in the pudding. You know about using an e-collar, and his dogs are really good. And again, he's not lighting them up. You know the people who just have a problem like your dog with its aggression and slap an e-collar on and and shock him hard when he's being aggressive. They should not. They're not dog trainers, and they shouldn't have an e collar. And uh, the same. A lot of owners, most owners, uh, are not capable of properly using an e collar. Uh, they're not. They, they they shouldn't use a palm collar because they'll put one on and let the dog pull with it. That's not what it's for. It's for loose leash and then a correction and then slack lead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a lot of people, a prong collar, you know, the dog pulls the, the older owner down onto their front. You know, you, you, you need power steering, um, but it's got to be done properly. And but Some dogs, you put a prong collar on and they stop pulling. They know it's on right away. You know, I've had shelter dogs that did that. Most shelters, you can't put a prong collar on the dog. But mm -hmm. I was the head of behavior at the big shelter here. And. You know, we worked a dog and he videoed it and I showed him. We put the prong collar on. He had tried 
all the other techniques, stopping when the dog pulls, stopping, going the other direction, do it 20 minutes, no effect. You would put the palm collar on, the dog knew it was on, never really gave a correction, the dog started working for me. You know, the ah. shoulders here, here in, in Florida, 200 dogs, all pit bulls. I mean, they can call them whatever they want, but they're pit bulls or pit bull crosses, and they, you know, they're just poorly bred pit bulls mainly. I said, mm -hmm. what are the little dogs? Well, the, the empty glass booths at the front, you know, they get adopted right away, um, but, you know, I saw a case two weeks ago with a wonderful, beautiful dog. You know, I can't help but look at these pit bulls and, you know, see some with really nice confirmation, beautiful mm -hmm. dog. And uh, it was in a pen, uh, getting to know potential adopters, and and they were they were ideal. You know, uh, the guy clearly had a past military background, tall, big guy with, you know, good posture. And, uh, uh, his, his partner was you know, a very respectable looking woman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had hopes for him, and then and I saw the dog was highly dog aggressive. I'm sure I was surprised they had it up for adoption. Mm -hmm. It was heartbreaking for me. Uh, the dog, a, a good trainer could, could bring the dog around, but uh, this dog was trouble. And I saw a dog a week ago. My friend sent me sent me a picture of uh, had the it was a blind little terrier a jag terrier very aggressive you know great hunting dog but uh, and he showed me somehow it had gone up the bookcase and uh, and had the insulation down and was trying to get through the floor to get to his other two dogs up above I mean that dog was aggressive. I mean, how it got to the top of the bookcase was amazing just by itself. And the dog was blind. Wow. Some of my first generation dogs were a handful. Mm -hmm. I had a dog that, uh, that was on a stainless steel cable and uh, the harness didn't break, the cable broke. And he attacked a D10 Caterpillar bulldozer. And wow. uh, he had the upper track in his mouth, all four feet off the ground. He was moving along with it, and luckily the operator saw him before it came around. And he ran over his head, and uh, that dog had more courage than sense. And he thought he was winning, you know. He had the right. Thing. All we can think is it said C A T on the side, and so <laughs> get it. Yeah. So you know, dogs like that, you can't find a home for. You know, no. they may be good for for not quitting in the pit. But they're not good for, for neighborhoods, for families, you know, mm. temperament. If there's got to be a problem, it's got to be the dog's got to be overly friendly. For me, uh, the pit bull is a perfect shape, healthy dog. Mm -hmm. Confirmation, you know, the length of their back, their height, uh, the angulation of their legs. Uh, for me, they're, you, you can't get more healthy than that. I mean, you may have a specialized need that you need a coursing hound that's got to be shaped like it is. But for an everyday dog and, and for a dog that change direction quickly, uh, that's agile, you know, they're ideal. Uh, when I got started in dogs, you didn't see pit bulls. You know, they were kept uh, behind closed doors and in the woods and in basements. Uh, I remember dogs in Harlem that... You know, we're in fighting condition. They look like skin and bones when they're ready to, to fight. They, and uh, they, had to wear, they had to wear coats. And they weren't causing problems because they weren't in the general public. You know, the problem was when uh, every 16-year-old kid in an inner-city neighborhood wants one. And, uh, and the dog's cute and handled improperly, most likely and gets to be a year old and it's a pain in the ass and it, it goes to his uncle or his grandmother and then goes to the shelter. And that's where the 200 dogs come from that are at the shelter where, where I work on Saturday. All right. You know, it's, 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 uh, and these dogs don't have the temperament of, of those old fighting dogs. You know, I found them universally, universally friendly with people and uh, you know, they weren't necessarily bred to fight well, they were bred to never quit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. 
and uh, you know, it's, it's not a humane thing, but it's been around for ever since two people had dogs, probably. And, uh, you know, most of those dogs in the shelter where I go are not especially animal aggressive. Right. It wouldn't be for adoption if they were. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I thought I controlled the name Old English Bulldog by copyright. Turns out it had to be trademarked. And when I discovered that uh, if I had trademarked it to enforce it, I would have had to sue the other registries in federal court where they are. And I wasn't willing to do that. Um, and so I lost the use of the name. And uh, very few of the lines are doing health screening. So uh, the people who followed me, we took uh, took the remaining blood and we called the dogs Levitt Bulldog. You know, people were already calling them Levitt Lime, so. Uh, and uh, so there's some, there's some good Bulldog boards. There's a number of, of uh, alternative Bulldog boards. I like the Old English Bulldog Club, the OEBC. OEBC. Uh, I, they're supportive and uh, not a lot of arguing, um, and uh, there's a handful of breeders there that are doing health screening uh, that are quality dog people. Uh, the majority aren't. I'm sorry, but that's the fact. Uh, there's a handful that are, and uh, they're showing the way forward, and people are not flocking to them because doing things right is expensive. And uh, and culling dogs and not using them for breeding is it puts you back years and uh, and is expensive and heartbreaking and people aren't willing to do it um, and and the good breeders go all the way from from uh, less extreme dogs to pretty bully uh, there's in Virginia Beach there's uh, breeders who are doing a great job and have healthy bully dogs that. Uh, that they fell screened and are agile and, and you know I, I saw a great dog years ago an English bulldog and uh, lived in on, on a farm in Virginia I, I didn't have a place to use him but I, I really wanted to uh, he could run 24 miles an hour and wow. he'd run behind the four wheeler the guy'd get to the end and take the dog and throw it in the stream and he'd come out of the stream cooled off a little bit and he'd run him back and the dog was a great little bulldog, and he, and he was, you know, nice, not fat, obviously, but, uh, you know, a great dog and would have been great for breeding. But they're few and far between. And I worry, you know, a lot of the breeds have problems now. Uh, the bull mastiff used to be healthier, and years ago I found out they were suffering from enlarged hearts. The boxer I would never use because of the cancer danger. Uh, you know, otherwise, boxer would have been good for me to use. And uh, in Europe, when you see one with a tail and ears, you, you don't realize what it is at first. They look like a thin OEB. You know, there's a dog called Lurcher, which is very interesting. And yeah. Lurcher is any dog technically that's half sight hound. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally in England, it was a poacher's dog. And if the dog saw the owner in town, it was supposed to walk by him and act like it didn't know him because they were a poacher's dog and it's illegal, but they hunted with them at night. And, uh, you know, they, they were popular around horse barns in the Northeast and probably still are in England, some. But interesting, crossbred dog. And, um, again, you need something to run. You're going to have to get it from a dog that can run. You know, the, the biggest rule in dog breeding is like breeds like. You know, it's a, it's a pretty simple con except um, but you know that's that's how I got my dogs to look like the old artwork and you asked me about what breeds I used and I, I picked breeds that I thought would give me a dog that looked like the old artwork uh, the truth is that you can use the same ratio of breeds with unrelated dogs and get a dog that looks completely different than I had pit bulls that were dominant that, that flew puppies that looked just like them. I had a, a bull mastiff female that all her puppies looked just like her. 
that the only way to know is to do the breathing and, and try it and see what you get. Mm -hmm. it's hard, but that's the truth of the matter for trying to create something. Well, any of these things for dog breeding and for dog training, um, talk is cheap. There's yeah. no thing. Uh, you know, you got to see the dog and, and see how they're doing. And the same with training. Yeah. Uh, talk is just talk. You know, here's the dog. You know, let's do something. And let's, let's see what you can do with the dog. And, you know, training the, the people is harder. And it's just so rare that you get a student that, that uh, that can take it in and do it. You know the way I train is, uh, I tell the person, they try it. You know whether it's uh, stationary position or moving, uh, they fail. I, I take the dog. The dog does it for me. They see how I do it, uh, and then I give them the leash and we try it with them and me walking them through. And it's amazing how few people can get it. It's just they close themselves off and think the dog can't be any better. It's not true. And uh, and then when you show them, it still doesn't go into their head. You know, I train with a group in Maryland, and just I never get tired of watching the, the beginner classes and seeing how my wonderful mentor brings the people forward and uh, big on proofing, you know, getting the dogs working, and then real quick hitting them with distraction. To, uh, to increase their capabilities. And, uh, you know, I see people, and guys are worse than women usually. Uh, and, you know, training and, uh, and the vet profession has been pretty well taken over by women. Used to be all guys. And mm -hmm. A lot of clinics I go to, other than the protection ones, are uh, mostly women. Like if somebody was thinking about starting to a breeding program, do you think uh, it's imperative that they also start to learn how to train dogs and, and learn, uh, for lack of a better term, dog psychology, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how can you be a complete dog person without it? And, it, and you know, the first thing when I see a dog is I want a demo. And every good trainer has got a demo dog. If you don't, you know, I mean, maybe your dog died and you got one coming, but, you know, I want to see what you can do. And uh, so, yeah, and, and training has come so far. There's resources like uh, Blue Dog. Blue Dog has these DVDs which show you dogs' methods of communicating with other dogs. Yeah. And I use these with shelter dogs sometimes. Some people are really good at it. And, uh, you know, there's calming signals. That you can use with dogs, uh, turning your head side to side slowly, licking your lips. Um, you know, there are various things, and you know, like going into a shelter where the dogs are all keyed up. Usually, uh, you can calm a dog down by using dog language, and uh, you know, most dogs try it with people, and the people don't respond, and the dogs stop trying. Mm -hmm. but, a friend who uses those techniques on aggressive dogs and and as well with it. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Training, there's something I'm very interested in. Uh, the premier guy with e-collars is Bart Ballon from Belgium. And uh, he's a great trainer. And he's a great teacher. He's a character, too. And he does clinics, and he comes here to the United States. And... Uh, he says that to do a perfect sit takes four to 6,000 repetitions. And he's developed a technique to get it down to four to 600. Oh, wow. and, uh, and he does it with this, this uh, program he calls Nay Po Po, which is negative, positive, positive. And negative in, in training terms means taking something away. And positive means adding something. So you can have positive, you can give a treat, or you can have positive punishment, means you're giving punishment. So, you know, that's how the tech terms technically are. And there's a quadrant of training, you know, if you really get into training, you come upon this first. So, his technique is, he uses negative first, and uh, what I saw him use negative was, uh, 
to teach the dog. It's called forced retrieve. So you, you give the dog a dowel into its mouth. Uh, the Schutzen people don't want to talk about this, and, and, and the obedience people don't either because they do sometimes in cruel ways. So you give them the dowel, and the obedience people, uh, the old timers, will pinch the ear. But, well, first the dog drops the dowel, and, and the handler pinches the ear and keeps pinching it until the dog picks up the dowel, and then they release the pressure. So that releasing, taking the the pain away is negative. Mm -hmm. That's the negative. Um, with an e-collar, you do it the same way. Give them the dowel. They drop the dowel. You do uh, continuous stimulation, tick, 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 at a low level. You know, not not pain, not not punishment. Just buzz, 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 until the dog picks up the dowel, and then you stop the buzzing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're negative. You're taking. The, the electric away and then you hit them with two positives and the dogs learn quicker very interesting and you know I want to learn more about it but uh, you know a lot of the top trainers I know are all about this May Popo training Bart Ballon B-E-L-L-O-N okay. and he's developed other things for for Schutzen for IPO he has a remote ball drop in the blinds uh, so that he can reward a dog at a distance as a wireless control and drops balls to the dog. Uh, a lot of those dogs are ball driven, you know, instead of food. Uh, right. the, the, the major rewards for dogs are food, ball, or tug. Mm -hmm. And they're all used the same way. You know, for, for me, it's a, it's a question of quality. So. Right. You know, I used to go to a lot of competitions, and you know, it's it's amazing to see a national strips and championship, a national PSA championship. Um, PSA to me is the highest level of protection, other than no pads. Uh, you know, their obedience at the top level is done with eight guys in padded suits screaming at the handler and dog and rushing in, and the dog wants nothing more than to bite him, and so it's it's the ultimate distraction. In the protection phases, they're doing things that are uh, super hard for the dog. Like they'll put up a tent, and it'll be dark inside with a, the whole floor covered with obstacles. And they'll send the dog in to get the decoy from bright light into dark. It's a really hard thing. Um, you know, the decoys have got uh, milk bottles with pennies and uh, palm fronds and other things that are very hard for the dog to get through. So, you know, for me, uh, I like seeing the quality of the dogs uh, going to agility and seeing what the good agility dogs can do. Um, this fall, I think I'm going to get to go see the National Police Dog Championship in, in Holland. Uh, to see a whole soccer stadium full of dog trainers is amazing. Wow. Uh, and they're a rough bunch, the trainers. Right. Right they right. use some pretty heavy-duty techniques. I, I took pictures before of, uh, of the training equipment with 50 collars with sharpened nails on the inside. You know, uh, e-collars are outlawed, but you know they still had those nail collars. And mm -hmm. you know, it's an industry there, and they're turning out these $20,000 Malinois and Dutch Shepherds, and you know, there's there's buyers for them. All right. Interesting. At the national championship, 10 dogs, uh, only two of them had papers. They don't care about papers on the Malinois. It's all about performance. I mean, they have the bloodlines, but the, the two were the Dutch Shepherds that had papers. And another thing about that competition, very interesting, they you only get to do it once with that dog. So, you know, you may hold them for a year to make sure they're, they're living up to their full, full potential. You don't get to come back and try it again. So... In answer to your question, I like seeing quality dogs, whether they're a mixed breed or not. Uh, the AKC a few years ago developed the All-American program for mixed breeds. Uh, mm -hmm. It's too bad they have to be neutered, but uh, neutered mixed breeds can compete at all AKC working events. So okay. my little dog, who's three-quarter Boston Terrier, one-quarter Dachshund, uh, she competed AKC and Rally and Obedience. 
And uh, in my club, we had a dog that was uh, that was one of the top rally dogs, uh, form of obedience in the country, a mixed breed. So you know, that's a wonderful thing. So, you know, I, I, I'm always interested in dogs with drive, uh, dogs that are bred with drive, and uh, and attention to the handler, uh, and and trainers' methods of, of introducing drive and uh, and contact with the owner. Um, mm -hmm. Got to do it, it, not put it off. You know, because it's like there's always something keeping you from doing it, but yeah. you got to find a, a group class. Yeah. And uh, and go. Uh, yeah. you know, I I go first to check out the trainer before I would ever do one. Uh, the people that I work with, I, I went and watched classes for two years. You know, I, I was uh, it was a short period. I was without dogs for a year and a half, and uh, and so I was watching training and then. For and participated as soon as I could, uh, but there, and you have to watch out. AKC clubs, uh, anybody who's titled a dog can teach a class there, so you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen, I've, I've seen classes without quality training, but uh, you know, again. You watch and you can see, you know, do they have good rapport with the person, good rapport with the dog, are they bringing the dogs along? You see it right away that the dogs are advancing. You know, the dog should always be advancing, and that's that's what what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. You know, always going forward, and uh, and the way I train in steps, whenever there's a problem, go back a step, so you know what you were doing first. You know that you started with luring. And putting the food on the dog's nose and getting and lifting it up and their rear end goes down they learn to sit and then you stop the luring and you they know sit and as soon as they sit good and food right away so you're moving forward and then intermediate intermediate reward and using just your voice for some of them but uh, you know criteria is important criteria is is the response from the do dog that you'll accept and that you'll reward. So, you know, I have a friend, I watched his methods training aggressive dogs for two years and, um, you know, part of the success is he has high criteria from the beginning. You know, the dog is out of position a little bit and, you know, the first day, first couple of days, he may give them a break, but then they're going to have to sit square to him and, uh, and there are ways to do that. You know, you can work along a wall and when you come to a stop, the dog can't swing its rear end out then. And, you know, you should always start with the dog on your left and leash in your right hand. This is a big thing for me because once people get started wrong, it's very hard to change. You mm -hmm. hold the, the leash on the dog side hand. And if you're using food, then you're using your off hand and twisting your body to feed the dog. And the dogs are all about the position of your shoulders. The agility dogs, they're going in the position of the handler's shoulders. You know, I trained with a former national champion, and, you know, again, I was the only guy, and she said, the dog's going in the direction of your boobs. So, you know, it can be me, but it's really your shoulders are going the same direction as your boobs, so really it can be your shoulders. Uh, so when you're twisting to reward a dog, a lot of dogs scoop behind you, and that's why, because they're reading your body language. So you hold the leash in your right hand, uh, treat bag on your left side, feeding with your left hand, dog on your left side, and then if you continue training enough, you should have the dog healing between your legs, and we, I call it side, where they're healing on your right side. So the protection dogs are got big on this tactical heel, which is the dogs between your legs, and, and it's really good. You know where the dog is. Uh, and uh, the dog's protected to some extent. And, uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Is there any kind of uh, advice that you would give to a young um, a person who is thinking about starting their own uh, uh, breeding program and, and, and in their first steps of becoming a real dog man? Yeah, I mean, with with videos like they are and the computer like it is, uh, 
you can see all the people working, all the famous people. Uh, Bart Bellin has videos. Uh, Michael Ellis on the West Coast is a wonderful trainer, a wonderful teacher of people, and you can see how they do it, and they walk you through. Uh, for softer stuff, there's a, a young woman named Kiko um, who shows you loose leash walking and leave it with a with a, a plate full of meat, you know, and these are short videos that you can emulate. Uh, Larry Crone is somebody, K-R-O-H-N, that I just found. That, uh, he's a good trainer, and, uh, you know, there's, there's internet teaching going on, too. There's some good trainers where you send videos back and forth, and they critique your work uh, if you can't find a good trainer locally. You know, the, the hard part is knowing who to follow, and, uh, you know, really you can decide that by seeing the, the trainer's dogs, and if they're happy and working willingly, uh, if they're working at a high level, uh, you know, Janet Dooley in Hanover, Pennsylvania is a, a, a top national protection trainer, uh, Australian woman who's here in this country now, and you can see videos of her amazing PSA performances. So, uh, you know, you, there's, there's a lot, uh, you know, the hard thing is, is finding the right teacher and then working hard and doing what they tell you. And they will appreciate that and give you special attention, uh, you know, uh, throw the effort into it. But And there's Patricia McConnell's books, her family dog book, brings you right through basic obedience training, um, gives you uh, like class lessons, do this, do this, here's one to go on to the next stage. So it, you can do it from a book. but. It, it's very hard to do from a book. I've trained my first dogs with the Keeler technique from a book, and uh, I needed a mentor in the worst way. I asked for a demo from a guy who had been a Secret Service trainer. This was back in the 70s. And I asked for a demo, and he brought his dog out, and he had his, his helper put on the sleeve. And he, what he was going to show is he was going to set the dog on the guy, and halfway there he was going to down the dog to show his control. And uh, he set the dog on the guy, dog, dog on the guy, and the dog was running, and he said, "Down!" And the dog never slowed up. <laughs> ran right by the decoy and ran out of sight. <laughs> you know, it was the worst demo I had ever seen. And, you know, I was looking for a mentor and a trainer, and you know, it was a big fail. Right. Yes, and you got to. The main thing is you got to try. Mm -hmm. You got to try to find somebody local and find a class. And if you can't do that, you got to find somebody an, an, an internet class if you have to. Uh, you know, some very p good people doing that. And uh, you know, you need somebody's help to show you. Dog training is not obvious. Mm -hmm. And there's some simple things you can do that just make it so much better. Loose leash walking. You know, not looking at your dog. You know, the dog should be looking at you. You should be looking ahead and watching the dog in peripheral vision. There's a lot of basic stuff that uh, you need to learn. And again, the big fight now is how much punishment to use. And I struggle with that. Uh, I use, with, with my dog, she never needs a leash correction and she doesn't get one. You know, with shelter dogs, uh, yeah, they need it. I, I had a, a very nice guy. You know, it's hard to get shelter dogs out of the run under control. Mm -hmm. they out and they just want to run. And uh, you know, a friend of mine's husband was a volunteer there. And, you know, he asked for help. So I showed him. And I took the dog and I went in and out ten times. And you know, by the tenth time, the dog was coming out okay. You, know, you just had, got to put in the time. And uh, he saw me doing it. And at the end, he said to me, he told the dog no. And I said, well, why the fuck wouldn't I tell the dog no? Mm -hmm. said, oh, you know, you're not supposed to tell the dog no. Well, you know, you, you failed. You failed for five, ten years. You know, I just succeeded and you saw me succeed uh, with, with a, an untrained dog. You know, so what more can I do? If you were going to start your program with the Levitt Bulldog today, what would you do different today than, than you did when you first created it? 
that's a hard one. I mean, I would like to do it. I would. It would have been easier to just breed uh, a healthy bulldog, like the one that could run 24 miles an hour, with a friendly uh, staffy bull or uh, or uh, pit bull, mm-hmm. you know, depending on the size you wanted. Uh, mm-hmm. The problem is to get enough genetic diversity. Uh, the rule of thumb is eight unrelated dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, the uh, the continental bulldog uh, had eight unrelated lines because FCI, the World Registry, wanted that. Uh, so that took a huge, a huge. It'd be hard to do a bulldog pit bull and have eight unrelated dogs and have enough genetic diversity. There's there's a vet from Canada called Bragg B R A G G, and he wrote the best uh, the best. Uh, information I've ever seen on genetic diversity. Uh, his breed was Siberian Huskies, and I think the number was five. I think all of the Siberian Huskies in North America are descended from five dogs. So okay. uh, inbreeding problems. And he brought dogs in from Siberia. They were the real thing, mm-hmm. Huskies. And the Canadian Kennel Club would not allow them to be bred into the breed. So, oh. That's started him, and he's got a wonderful series of articles on genetic diversity and how to get it, and uh, outcrosses. And mm-hmm. Technically, mongrels should be our healthiest dog. But the, the interesting thing is, what I found is on crossbred dogs, that completely unrelated, two different breeds, I still had genetic problems come out right away. So. It's it's all a crapshoot, and all you can do is try it and see. Glad to help, and you have my email. Get in touch yeah. with anything I can do to help you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Weber. I really appreciate it. And uh, start doing stuff. And everybody listening, you know, yeah. uh, time passes, and you know, try and find a, a program to go with, or uh, if you have to, a book. But it's best if you can find a good trainer. Uh, but you know, there's all kinds of resources out there. And, and you'll love it, and you'll love, and it, it'll make things easier in the house too. You know, yeah. You're struggling with a dog that's got aggression problems, and you know that's really the purpose for obedience. You know, it's when you're by the side of the right road and the car's coming by, and you want to, you want your dog to sit on cue immediately and stay there. And you know, it just makes life so much easier when you open the door. You don't want the dog rushing out. Mm-hmm. You have it great opportunity every day every time you open a door you know uh, uh, my dog is 10 and she's got titles and you know every door I come to she sits until she's released and then we go through the door and you know with with beginner dogs they have to sit on the other side the same with feeding you know that that the food goes down on the floor dogs in a sit doesn't doesn't break the sit until released and if they break it, food goes back up uh, three tries, and then the food goes back on the counter. Ten mm-hmm. minutes, you can try again. You know, you have wonderful opportunities every day to train and advance your dog. Right, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thank nice you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Nice meeting you. See you. Bye-bye.